sometimes people like Catherine ask you to do something, and you read it on, usually on the email, and uh, you think, that would be interesting, so you say yes. It's only later that you wish you'd said no. <laughs> <laughs> because once you start to think about this subject, the things that you worry about. Poetics is a funny word, isn't it? Then I found a book at the weekend, which I'm in, called The Poetics of the Motorway. So I thought I'd have a look at that, to see if there's any clue. I realized there wasn't. So I'm trying to take it sort of seriously. You know, is there a, a relationship between poetry and architecture? Well, there clearly is, and you can see from Niles' beautiful work, that there is something. There is some quality to the images that he showed us. And if you go to some of those buildings, I think you'll find it as well. There is something that maybe architecture can communicate, but it's not clear. And it seems to me that that's almost the opposite of what uh, poetry is. It's not always clear, but it is a condensed form of, of the present tense. Now, in architecture, we're always dealing, generally speaking, with the future. We're trying to predict a future which, has, which hopefully will be built, um, and you don't really know what it's like. And part of the art of what we do is trying to determine um, or to imagine, I was going to say in an accurate way, not always. Um, and therefore, we need all the help that we can. And maybe we need a poet or two to try and bring that sense of the future into the present, which might help us. And I believe some of your references to poems um, that you found useful at the beginnings, and that's the important, the beginnings of a project is very important. There are some architects that uh, do things, and you mentioned one of them, Bruno Taut, um, marvelous architect, didn't build very much. I'm not sure he built anything, did he? Doesn't matter. But uh, it puts me in mind of, of, of people like um, Ledoux, who did um, a beautiful, he did a number of things, and he did build a few things, but he did a house for the man in charge of the waterworks. It's not actually called that, I don't think, um, but anyway, that's what it's for. And it has the water rushing through the center of the house. Do you know that one? Actually, I did want to ask, how many architects are there here? Hands up. Mm. Third, maybe. That's interesting. That tells you something about architects. Um, but it's a beautiful piece. And why did he draw this thing? Because it was never going to be built. Or indeed, Boulay, who did the monument to, uh, to, to uh, Isaac Newton, which is never intended to be built. In fact, at that time, the technology to build what he drew was not, you couldn't do it. And yet he could see beyond those chains that actually kept most, or keep most architects literally on the ground. And uh, I think that's an interesting, why would you do that? Because in a way, it's a form of poetry. It's trying to distill something into, in this case, an, an image or a series of images, perhaps accompanied by words, which actually suggest another possibility to see beyond what we know. And I think poetry is seeing beyond what we know or to open our eyes to something that we already know but didn't realize that, that we do. Myself, I did a project a long time ago called A House with Six Identical Rooms. And the idea was that you have all the accoutrements of a house in one room, but you'd have it six times so that when you lived in a space, and you don't want to tidy it up, you just go next door, and there it is, perfect. <laughs> and you could do that six times, and then on the seventh day when God rested, you had to work very hard because you've been delaying this. And it seemed to me that's okay. You were never going to build it. It might be very interesting. Anyway, that's another thing. It seems to me that there's something about ambience, which is, it is possible in architecture, whether you build it or not, to actually maybe achieve something of the poet. Usually, architecture 
is uh, aligned with music, not poetry, because music has it's, its temporal, it has interval, it has rhythm, all of those traditional things that actually traditional architecture tried to deal with in terms of the composition. It's a word you don't hear architects talking about much, proportion, composition. You don't teach it in schools, you know. I've never heard the word proportion mentioned in a school of architecture anywhere in the world, maybe at the Bartlett. <laughs> Who knows? I never go there. I think it's important. But of course, architecture isn't quite like that. That's why it's not mentioned anymore. It's about maybe something else. So what it is about, of course, is always the eternal question that we ask ourselves and never really reach an answer. We can experiment. I do have a project at the moment in Spain uh, called uh, Las Iras, where I'm being asked to do a sort of master plan of the future of actually quite a large area of land, rather beautiful land. Um, I decided not to do any drawings. Um, well, hints of sketches, but the main point is to write a story, which I've done, which out outlines a possible future, but it's a possible future that can be corrupted, and hopefully it will be corrupted, and we've started in some ways. So you start off by saying all we need to make this place work is somewhere to sleep, somewhere to go to the lavatory, somewhere to cook, and somewhere to wash. After that, you can do anything. And here, this is one series of things that you could do here, the way that this place could evolve, and I think evolution is a very important part of not only that project, but learning from that project than in other projects, perhaps in a more urban situation, which is slightly more difficult. I do occasionally write poetry to get, like you, you're discovering poems now, to, to try and get to the essence of what it is that might be possible in a project. And I'm not saying I'm a great poet, but I find it helpful to try and put something down in a very concise way to capture something of the ambience or the possibility or the way that people might feel or what they might do. And if you can do that, usually accompanied by a bottle of wine at the kitchen table, makes life easier for me. I often feel a bit like David Hockney, you know, when he was asked, you know, does he go out much? Yeah, I don't go out much, you know, because where would I go? You can't smoke anywhere except at home. So, <laughs> including the RIBA, I have to say. But anyway, nonetheless, I think I first started to think about these things. And I've lost a bit of paper. Oh, no, I haven't. Here it is. When I, was I used to work for an architect called Cedric Price, who I have great, and still do have great admiration for. Uh, sadly, he's, he's dead, but um, in, and I won't read this, but uh, I'll read a little bit of it. In a um, letter from an exile by Pound, there is something of the essence of Cedric in it, and I remember thinking that a long time ago, and it was a long time ago when I read him. So, I'm never sure I say these words um, correctly, pronounce them correctly. So kin of Rakuho, ancient friend, I now remember that you built me a special tavern. Now, it's not because Cedric drank a lot that this has resonance, but maybe in part. By the, si by the south side of the bridge at Ten Shin, with yellow, gold, and white jewels, we paid for the songs and laughter, and we were drunk for month after month forgetting the kings and princes. Intelligent men came drifting in from the sea and from the west border, and with them, and with you especially, there was nothing at cross purpose. And they made nothing of sea crossing or of mountain crossing, if only they could be of that fellowship. And we all spoke out our hearts and minds, and without regret, and I think without regret is quite important. I don't know. Cedric could have regretted a lot of things, but he never did, of course. And I think uh, there's a sort of element in my mind when I read that, and of course, I don't know if any of you knew him, maybe you don't recognize him within those few words. I could go on with that poem, but I, but I won't. 
But I'd like to leave you, this is not with the poem, but I'm doing, working currently on another project in, in, in China. It's a very large area of landscape, and there will be buildings in it, and it's intended as sort of art and agricultural park. I like those two elements together. It can be useful and delightful at the same time, hopefully. So I literally started it by writing this very short piece. Daniel sat and watched. It was a very slow watch. He had occupied the terrace inhabited by larks and larkspur since 2.35 p.m., where he consumed a very strong double espresso after a satisfying lunch indoors. He did not move, and it was now 10 p.m. His entertainment was light. He had long learnt to observe subtle changes. In the strong afternoon, flashes flashed. An assault of flickers creating a fullness of brightness that made all things invisible. Patches of dazzle through which everything else was rendered secondary. Whiteness tinged with colour. Ethereal earthliness. The shadows lengthened and rainbows danced. It went on beyond that. If I could draw that, I would. But I wouldn't know how to draw it. If I can create it, it's all in the future, remember. I will. Thank you.